Great. So now I'm going to turn it over to Mimi. And coming to us from Michigan, right? Hi, everybody. I'm Mimi Gonzalez, uh, or Mimi Gonzalez Barrias, or Rosa Noemi Gonzalez Barrias. Uh, <laughs> I've had a lot of names and a lot of stage names. And I believe that identity is a spectrum. And that's what the life journey is that we're doing here the whole time. Um, when I came out of the closet uh, in my early 20s, people used to say, and other older lesbians and, you know, people in the community that I was new to used to say, don't give me a label. Labels are for cans. But now there are so many labels. <laughs> now you have to have all the labels because everybody wants to know every one of their identities and have them acknowledged, uh, not ignored. So I used to say I was a lesbian identified bisexual woman of color, tax paying, library going, voting, daughter of an immigrant. I mean, how many labels can I lay on myself? A lot. Uh, so as long as I go with this idea that identity is a spectrum and I get to be many identities. And Mimi Gonzalez is one that's performed at the Minneapolis Pride um, a couple of times and got to be at the Walker because of a big show there after Pride one year. Um, nice. And uh, I love Minneapolis and, and St. Paul by default, <laughs> your, your sister city there, because a dear friend of mine lives there and I've visited many times and we go up to Finland. We've been in the boundary waters because of this Minneapolis friend of mine. Uh, who I was roommates with in San Francisco and who became an acupuncturist and returned to Minneapolis and lives in Powderhorn, lives right by Powderhorn Park and uh, is a great acupuncturist. So uh, I have great feeling for Minneapolis. I, I think there's something incredibly progressive and wonderful about that state because that state gave us Huber Humphrey and Paul Wellstone, uh, really incredibly progressive legislators and I'm sure gave us so much uh, that state has given this country a lot uh, those two make a big impression um I spent uh, I've spent over 30 years doing stand-up comedy which is not what I went to college for for undergrad <laughs> but in every one of my uh comedy notebooks were poems and I always thought about Dream B and my second Saturn return. And for my second Saturn return, I went back to San Francisco and went to Mills College and got an MFA at age 58. Um, and I really believe that you're calling, that there's an old saying, many are called, but few are chosen. And that's because you have to choose yourself. And I can definitively say that many of my depressions were caused by being a writer who wasn't writing. And I believe that's true for many people who are painters, musicians, dancers, singers, sculptors, carpenters. We are driven to express ourselves as human beings. And we live in a culture that monetizes everything <laughs> that says, well, if you're not rich and famous, you must suck. You know, it's not worth it. You're not, don't waste your time. Um, and that is one of the most soul killing things we can hear on this planet is to have everything measured by uh, the capital measure stick, um, yardstick. And I, um, finally realized, well, I am still called to write and I have to answer the call, whether it's recognized or published or makes any money or no money. Writing workshops really helped return me and anchor me in something in myself that helped keep me sane. And uh, I knew it was gonna be poetry, but tonight I'm not bringing you a poem. <laughs> Tonight, what I'm gonna to bring you is the most important thing about writing, and that's the act of writing. And 
we're going to generate writing. This is a generative writing workshop. And um, I have a very specific topic for you tonight. Uh, and before we begin that topic, we're going to do a free write. And a free write is just five minutes of your pen to the page, just keeping your pen on the page. And I want you to hold this idea in your head. This is kind of my credo. Um, Martha Graham was an incredible dancer. And um, Martha Graham gave this quote to somebody, said this while she was being interviewed about our creativity. Quote, there is a vitality, a life force, a quickening that is translated through you into action. And because there is only one of you in all time, this expression is unique. If you block it, it will never exist through any other medium and be lost. The world will not have it. It is not your business to determine how good it is, nor how valuable it is, nor how it compares with other expressions. It is your business to keep it yours. You do not have to believe in yourself or your work. You have to keep directly open to and aware of the urges that motivate you. Keep the channel open. No artist is pleased. There is no satisfaction at any time. There is only a blessed unrest that keeps us marching and makes us more alive than others. End quote. You've had some moments of blessed unrest. And you've also had so many moments in a day of inspiration that's in you to create. I'm going to set my timer for five minutes and you're just going to write to that general idea. Just to loosen your hand up around the pen or on your laptop, however you choose to write. And okay, let's turn that. No, oh, if I turn that off, shoot, you won't hear the timer. Okay, I'm setting the timer and uh, I'll ask everyone to mute, especially the people that type. <laughs> if you're not a typer, don't worry about it. Uh, here we go.
That was a call. Time is not up yet. Okay, that's the timer. So take another minute and finish what you caught because some of you are still writing. Okay, one more minute. Mimi, would you be able to um, send that quote to me and over email so I can um, send it so everyone has it eventually at some point? <laughs> Not right now, but I mean after the after the class. The second time I lived in New York, I was still chanting Nam Myoho Renge Kyo with a bunch of New York Buddhists. We were in... Um, Midtown, and we were chanting at a dancer's house. And I saw the quote, and the second time I went back there, I wrote it down in paper, pencil on this piece of paper. <laughs> so I'm going to have to look for the quote. Uh, I, I don't really want to send you this one. Oh, uh, sure. <laughs> but uh, I'll have to find it officially. But, but I, I want everybody to have that quote. I mean, that quote has really helped me just remind myself you know this is the this is part of the artistic and creative struggle to express ourselves so I want to share that with everybody um, and some people have heard it because Martha Graham was around for a long time I even saw a uh, YouTube video where Martha Graham is teaching Helen Keller about dance and it was incredible because uh, a dancer would stand in front of her and, and Martha Graham put her hands on their waist and then they did a, a pirouette, a jump, a leap. And wow. it was really, I just thought that's incredible that Martha Graham is making dance understandable for Helen Keller. I mean, you know. Right. When it gets you two down, uh, there are a few things that can bring us back, you know? 
Uh, and that that is hope in humanity. So how'd that feel? Do you feel like writing, like you're a writer? You were writing. So yeah, yeah. you're writers. You feel yeah. good? Your hands feel good? Your writing muscle feels awakened? Um, we're in this series called The Art of Living. And it is produced by Art to Change the World. And Kelly Frankenberg is leading the art of living. In one of our correspondences, though, she also said that this was part of the cabin fever reliever, which I think is another series of events. Is that correct, Kelly? Um, well, it morphed into something and then everybody voted and that's the title they like the best. So I had to let it go and <laughs> name it cabin fever reliever. But it it's, started with the art of living. Yes. Oh, it's really the art of living, but it's currently known as cabin fever reliever yeah sure <laughs> well <A> -A. Um, <laughs> say that again deb i said aka aka exactly yeah. um i uh i live in a little cabin and uh i've i'm from michigan and even though i've lived on the coasts uh i came back here i've been here many for almost two decades in this little cabin so I understand what cabin fever is. It used to be worse um, when there really was weather. And I think all of us were old enough to know what I mean by that. Uh, what a winter used, what winter used to actually be. Um, and um, cabin fever is a very strange time. And I want to tonight to lean into exile, this idea of exile. Mm -hmm. And a lot of things in the world could be um, addressed by that right at this very moment. Mm -hmm. But exile is something that can happen to us in our creativity, to members of our family, to um, a pet that's some done, done something terrible and wrong and is now banished to their cage or lives outside on a chain or maybe... Uh, it's a poem that you thought about writing, but you just never wrote it because it lives in that idea that you already did it, which you didn't. You, meaning I. <laughs> that second person, you, meaning I. Uh, the idea of exile and being a shut in or being shut out is something that I just want you to think about. And if you could, for two minutes, just write everything you associate with shut in, shut out, and exile. Just for two minutes. Just a list. A list. Uh, you can make it a list poem. Uh, just write for two minutes about everything you think of for exile, shut in, and shut out.
Okay. Thank you for doing that. And now for an interesting take on exile. I don't know if uh, a lot of you are familiar with um, Women Who Run With the Wolves. Oh, yeah. Book, which is a really wonderful Clarissa Pincola Estes uh, collection of stories and um, stories and myths that help return women back to our power. I didn't know if there were going to be men in this gathering or not, but I kind of didn't care. Thought, well, these yeah. lessons for women, men could learn if they're uh, open to it, if they're aware of opportunity as it's right in front of them. Um, today, we're all going to take turns reading this. I've um, scanned the pages. I don't want to keep looking over there. The scan is right here. Um, you might have to, oh, thank you for making me a host. So I can just share screen easily. Oh, I didn't, but did okay. it work? Okay. It worked. <laughs> here we go. Oh, okay. So here's what I'd like us to do. I would like us to take turns uh, reading a paragraph each. Okay. And so... Here's who I see in this order, uh, me, Kelly, Mel, Sam, Daphne, Deb. And if we get to alchemy and they can read, great. If not, it's okay. Uh, we'll just go back to me, okay? Um, this is the Ugly Duckling. And she has collected the uh, the best sources are. This is her retelling of it from this is a wonderful way to spend a winter or a season or any time with a group of your friends, women who run with the wolves. I know this book is from the 90s. I believe it's from the 90s. Uh, let's just find that out for sure. I think I have a copy. I also have a set of CDs where she he reads stories and talks about stories. And she's those every once in a while. So, yeah. yeah, she's produced so many CDs now. I wish she would go. I love to have a book in my hand, but oh, yeah. she, you know, she's doing most of her stuff through through CDs now. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so she has translated this. Well, she has taken it from um, Hans Christian Andersen. Uh, and this story <clears throat> is from was first published in 1845. <laughs> mm. and it's just beautiful that this story still is with us. I wish I could find the original stone soup story, but I understand stone soup is in a lot of cultures. So mm -hmm. we're going to read The Ugly Duckling. I'll read the first paragraph, then every paragraph that follows, let's take turns, and you'll have to wait for me to change pages. Okay, The Ugly Duckling. It was near the time of harvest. The old women were making green dolls from corn sheaves. The old men were mending the blankets. The girls were embroidering their white dresses with blood-red flowers. The boys were singing as they pitched golden hay. The women were knitting scratchy shirts for the coming winter. The men were helping to pick and pull and cut and hoe the fruits the fields had brought forth. The wind was just beginning to loosen the leaves a little more and then a little more each day. And down by the river, there was a mother duck brooding on her nest of eggs. Everything was going as it should for this mother duck, and finally, one by one, her eggs began to tremble and shake until the shells cracked and out staggered all her new ducklings. But there was one egg left, a very big egg. It just sat there like a stone. An old duck came by, and the duck mother showed off her new children. Aren't they good-looking, she bragged. But the unhatched egg caught the old duck's attention, and she tried to dissuade the duck mother from sitting on that egg any longer. Okay, can you see this one? 
can you see that I've changed pages? Mm -hmm. Kind of small. Yeah, okay, let me make that bigger. Definitely let me make that bigger. Okay, who's next? Hold on. Oh, why aren't you letting me make this bigger? Hmm. All right, I know another trick. There we go. Okay. Can you see that? And read uh, when we get to these short paragraphs, take two or three of them. Kelly and Mel will come back to you and you take two or three when it comes to the, the, these sizes, okay? Okay. Now there's an older duck, remember? Uh, the old duck came up and she's... Oh. Yeah. Do you see that, Sam? Oh, yes. Is it my turn? Yes. Oh, um, at the top of the page of 168? Yes. Okay. It's a turkey egg, explained the old duck. Not a proper kind of egg at all. Can't get a turkey into the water, you know. She knew, or she had tried. But the duck mother felt that she had been sitting for such a long time, a little longer would not hurt. I'm not worried about that, she said. But do you know that scoundrel father of these ducklings hasn't come to visit me once? But eventually the big egg began to shudder and roll. It finally broke open and out tumbled a big, ungangly creature. His skin was etched with curly red and blue veins. His feet were pale purple, his eyes transparent pink. The duck mother cocked her head and stretched her neck and peered at him. She couldn't help herself. She pronounced him ugly. Maybe it is a turkey after all, she worried. But when the ugly duckling took to the water and the other offspring, sorry, took to the water with the other offspring, the duck mother saw that he swam straight and true. Yes, he's one of my own, even though he's very peculiar in appearance. But actually, in the right light, he is almost handsome. Yeah. Okay, so me. Um, so she presented him to the other creatures. Can you move it over to the left at all? I don't know how to close that panel over there. So maybe I can, hold on. Maybe I can pull this whole, is this helpful? I can't close that panel with the other pages on there. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a little better. If you can go one more to the yeah. left. How's oh, that? Sidebar, maybe. I hit the sidebar. Okay, okay. So she presented him to the other creatures in the farmyard, but before she knew it, another duck, duck shot across the courtyard and bit the ugly duckling right in the neck. The duck mother cried, stop, but the bully sputtered. Well, he looks so strange and ugly. He needs to be pushed around. And the queen duck with the red rag on her head, on her legs, said, oh, another brood, as though he didn't have enough mouths to feed. And that one over there, the big ugly one, well, surely he's a big mistake. Or he's a mistake. Okay. So it'll go back to you, I maybe. Okay. He's not a mistake, said the duck mother. He's going to be very strong. He just laid in the egg too long and is yet a little misshapen. He'll straighten out, though, you'll see. She groomed the ugly duckling's feathers and licked his cowlicks. But the others did all they could to harass the ugly duckling. They flew at him, bit him, pecked him, hissed and screeched at him. And their torment of him grew worse as time went on. He hid, he dodged, he zigzagged left and right, but he could not escape. The duckling was as miserable as any creature could be. At first, his mother defended him, but then even she grew tired of it all and exclaimed in exasperation, I wish you would just go away. 
And so the ugly duckling ran away with most of his feathers pulled out and looking extremely bedraggled. He ran and ran until he reached a marsh. There he lay down at the water's edge. Okay, did we catch the last? There he lay down at the water's edge with, I'm sorry about the quality of my. <laughs> That's okay. With his neck stretched Amy. out and sipped as he could from the water now and then. From the rushes, two ganders watched him. They were young and full of themselves. Say there, you ugly thin thing, they sniggered. Want to come with us over to the next county? There's a gaggle of young unmarried geese over there. <laughs> right for the choosing. That's good. <laughs> Suddenly, shots rang out, and the ganders fell with a thud. And the marsh water went, the marsh water ran red with their blood. The ugly duckling dived for cover and all around were shots and smoke and dogs barking. At last, the marsh became quiet and the duckling ran and flew as far away as he could. Toward nightfall, he came to a poor hovel. The door was hanging by a thread. There were more cracks than walls. Here lived an old raggedy woman with her uncombed cat and her cross-eyed hen. The cat earned her keep with the old woman by catching mice, and the hen earned her keep by laying eggs. The old woman felt lucky to have found a duck. Maybe it will lay eggs, she thought, and if not, we can kill it and eat it. Oh, so the duck stayed. But he was tormented by the cat and hen who asked him, what good are you if you cannot lay and you cannot catch? What I love best, sighed the duckling, is to be under, whether it is under the wide blue sky or under the cool blue water. The cat could make no sense of being underwater and criticized the duckling for his stupid dreams. The hen could make no sense of getting her feathers all wet, and she made fun of the duckling too. In the end, it was clear there would be no peace for the duckling there, so he left to see if things would be better down the road. He came upon a pond, and as he swam there, it became colder and colder. A flock of creatures flew overhead, and the most beautiful Um, the most beautiful he had ever seen. They cried down to him, and hearing their sounds made his heart leap and break at the same time. He cried back, and a sound he had never before made. He had never seen creatures more beautiful, and he had never felt more bereft. He turned and turned in the water to watch them till they flew out of sight. Then he dove to the bottom of the lake and huddled there, trembling. He was beside himself, for he felt a desperate uh, love for those great white birds, a love he could not understand. Okay. A colder wind began. It blew harder and harder through the... I can't quite see that. Can you... Day. Oh, today. And snow came upon frost. The old men broke the ice in in the milk oh. pails. Okay. Broke the ice. Whoops. Can you see that better? Can you take it down a little bit? Okay. Um the old oh yes. The old men broke the ice in the make milk pails and the old woman. Women spun long into the night. The mother's bed. That three mouths, thank you, by once by candlelight, and the men search for. It's cutting off. Hold on a second. Huh? I don't know why it didn't all. No, hold on just a second. Okay. And the, the mother's felt fed three mouthfuls. And the and the men, hold on just a second. The mothers fed three mouths at once by candlelight, and the men searched for the 
Let's see. I'm trying to find the place. Sheep under white skies at midnight. Do you see that? Oh, yes, right now. Okay, the young men went waist beat deep in the snow to go to milking, and the girls imagined they saw the faces of handsome young men in the flames of the fire while they cooked. And down at the pond nearby, the duckling had to swim faster and faster in circles to keep a place for himself in the ice. One morning, the duckling found himself frozen in the ice, and it was then that he felt that he would die. Two mallards flew down and skidded onto the ice. They surveyed the duck. You're ugly, they barked. Too bad. So sad. Nothing can be done for such as you. And off they flew. And luckily, a farmer came by and fed My turn. The duck. Oh, sorry. My turn. <laughs> what? Is that me? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Luckily, a farmer came by and freed the duckling by breaking the ice with his staff. He lifted the duckling up and tucked him under his coat and marched home. In the farmer's house, the children reached for the duckling, but he was afraid. He flew up to the rafters, making all the dust fall down into the butter. From there, he dove right into the milk pitcher. And as he struggled out, all wet and woozy, he fell over into the flour barrel. The farmer's wife chased him with her broom, and the children screamed with laughter. The duckling flapped through the cat's door, and outside at last lay in the snow half dead. From there, he struggled on till he came to another pond, then another house, another pond, another house, and the entire winter was spent this way, alternating between life and death. And even so, the gentle breath of spring came again, and the old woman shook out the feather beds, and the old men put away their long underwear. New babies came in the night, while fathers paced the yard under starry skies. During daylight, the young girls put daffodils in their hair and young men studied girls' ankles. And on a pond nearby, the water became warmer and the ugly duckling who floated there stretched his wings. How strong and big his wings were. They lifted him high over the land. For the air he saw, the, or the orchards in the white gowns, the farmers plowing, the young of all the nature hatching, tumbling, buzzing, and swimming. Also paddling on the pond were three swans, the same beautiful creatures he had seen the autumn before, those that so caused his heart to ache. He felt pulled to join them. Sam. Is it my turn? It's Sam. Sam. Oh, so what if they act as though they like me, and then just as I join them, they fly away laughing, thought the duckling. But he glided down and landed on the pond, his heart beating hard. As soon as they saw him, the swans began to swim toward him. No doubt I am about to meet my end, thought the duckling. But if I... I don't see anything at all. I know, I've got it, I've got it. I don't know why I'm... <laughs> I can see the page I want to go to. There we go. Yeah. Here we are, the final page. But if I am to be killed than rather by these beautiful creatures than by hunters, farmers, wives, or long winters. And he bowed his head to await the blows. But la, in the reflection in the water, he saw a swan in full dress. Swan, swan, a swan. That's a typo. Slow, <laughs> slow eyes and all. The ugly duckling did not at first recognize himself, for he looked just like the beautiful stranger, just like those he had admired from afar. Mm. And it turned out that he was one of them after all. His egg had accidentally rolled into a family of ducks. He was a swan, a glorious swan. And for the first time, his own kind came near him and touched him gently and lovingly with their wingtips. They groomed him with their beaks and swam round and round him in greeting. And the children who came to feed the swan, but the bread cried out, there's a new one. And as children everywhere do, they ran to tell everyone. And the old woman came down to the water and braiding their long silver hair. And the young men cupped the deep green water in their hands and flicked it at the young girls who blushed like petals. 
The men took time away from milking just to breathe the air. The women took time away from mending just to laugh with their mates. And the old men told stories about how war is too long and life is too short. And one by one, because of life and passion and time passing, they all danced away. The young men and the young women all danced away. And the old ones, the husbands, the wives, they all danced away. The children in the swans all danced away, leaving just us. And in springtime, and another mother duck down by the river, nesting on her, I don't quite get the last eggs. Eggs, thank you. <laughs> it's kind of cutting off, so I, there. Okay, uh, you know, I beg your pardon for the uh, nature of the dots per inch that I did not um, inform my scanner to, to make that a little bit better. Uh, but I just love these details because when I got the nursery rhyme at school, it wasn't this elaborate. There were not... I didn't realize there were this many trials and struggles of the ugly duckling to go through. I didn't realize that the ugly duckling had come close to, please, come on. Having little, ah. Oh. Godness gracious, please, for the love of the black baby, Jesus. All right. <laughs> yeah, that's the first time that didn't work, and it's, oh, I'm sorry. You have bro. to plug it in first, Mimi. You told me after I did my bit in my comedy sketch, you said, make sure you plug in the mic. <laughs> Turn on the mic. <laughs> I don't know what's happening with, the, with this extension cord that... Uh, it's ridiculous. All right. I can hear you. <laughs> there were some beats in this story that um are really uh that are new, you know. The can you talk about some things that really stood out for you? Can everybody kind of um share? some new beats or um, new parts of the story that you weren't aware of before or any parts of the story that just stand out to you? Well, for me, it was like the people they were describing in the background. Like when I was younger, I just remembered like there's a duck and then, you know, you're in that like cartoon animal world and you don't think about there's people too. You know, they tried to relate it to actual life, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I love the description and how, you know, talk about the young men and the young women and how they, um, how everybody just is in this, in this world. Because I had never heard that part either. That it was just animals when I heard it. And it was more like, there was like, more like a fable where the moral of the story is this. You know, it wasn't so much storytelling, which I really enjoy. I'll read the chat. Um, Alchemy said the ending with all the dancing and leaving and next spring was new to me. Yeah, the next spring, that's right. A whole, a whole year. You know about stone soup, Alchemy, let me know. We'll take all, collect all stories on stone soup. Uh, Thank you. We're still going through reactions to the story. How does that anybody? I'm I'm pondering the metamorphosis, the unconscious transformation that happened, mm -hmm. and the the self surprise to have arrived at that that point and that beauty and that um, reason to love and adore oneself when it was almost kind of sad for me because when you know the the swans are like petting him and touching him and he feels loved and, and fitting in and it's like it's almost like this child that's been neglected right and no one has loved it 
and for the mm -hmm. worst reasons. And then, I mean, it just, that part just really just depresses me. Mm -hmm. I think about it like that way. I think it really shows um, how important it is to find your tribe. And I have to say that I can't remember the original story from when I was a child. I know it was an ugly duckling story, but I can't really say what was different. But yeah, find your tribe or you will sink <laughs> like a stone. I mean, I went through that because I had to move to, you know, back to the Midwest from New York City, 30 years in New York City, and boy, oof. Oh. Well, when you move to a place where you don't know one person besides your husband, but that doesn't count. Okay, so then that's when you really have to, I mean, it's sink or swim in that kind of situation, not knowing mm -hmm. you're moving to a place and not knowing one person. So find your tribe. St. Paul, after 30 years in New York City? Yeah. Well, first, it was Prescott, Wisconsin, believe it or not. <laughs> like, no diversity, you know, not much art, music. I mean, they have a little something. Every place has a little something. But then, after a year and a half there, I came to St. Paul, and, and that's when... And, but then, the pandemic, right? So... Well, and you're you're pretty much say telling Daphne's story about Daphne traveling all over and ending up in basically the boundary waters all by herself. <laughs> you're reading you're reading my mind, Kelly. Um, <laughs> because I, I mean what it goes back to me is being shut out, being shut in, and being in exile in Grand Marais, the most beautiful little town in Minnesota. Mm. You know. Wow. But being shut in and being shut out, it's not fun. Alone up there, was it was it uh, a deep winter? Was it like International Falls, the biggest snowfall record? Cold I arrived winter? at the beginning of the pandemic, so that was a that was a bigger issue than the snowfall. Everybody disappeared. I didn't know anybody. Everybody disappeared. Everything closed down. Um, I get gotten rid of my car because I was going to walk everywhere. Then the snow and ice came. <laughs> So, yeah. Wow. You have a definite exile story. Yeah, being an ex-New Yorker, yeah. yeah so all, ex all you guys are ex-New Yorkers here? Sam, Daphne, and Mimi? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you, yeah. Mimi, you mentioned two things I will never mention around here. Well, now I will, because I'm meeting more people like who... Anyway, which is your Saturn return and Nam Yoho Renge Kyo. So, <laughs> so, yeah, anyway, that's really, and I went to school in Michigan, so Michigan. So yeah. I'm always glad to hear about things like that. Yes. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, I'm so happy that, uh, you know, that there's, that there's points of contact and mutual recognition, uh, some mutual admiration. And everywhere I traveled as a comic, People would always say to me afterwards, what part of New York are you from, huh? Listen to you, listen to you. And then they put on a Sopranos accent and they'd be like, yeah, I bet you're from the Bronx. And I'm not ashamed. <laughs> so I would tell them what part of New York I'm from. Detroit. I'm not from New York. <laughs> it's just a deep voice. Uh, but I was conceived in a bathtub in New York City. And I'd like to thank my mother <laughs> for making that pertinent enough information that I needed <laughs> deeming that pertinent in my life wow right. so i returned like a little pisces and a cuban i got back to that water i got back to manhattan you know but there's really nothing uh new york is really an incredible experience but just like that poem um graduation addressed to the class of was it 1997 moved to new york live in new york once but leave before it makes you too hard. Live in Northern California once, but leave before it makes you too soft. Do you remember that piece? Where And then it ends, wear sunscreen. She starts with <laughs> wear sunscreen and she ends it with wear sunscreen. Hmm. Beautiful piece. Mel, were there things about this uh, story that hit you? It was interesting. So 
in one of my lives, I was a preschool teacher. So all of those stories are so remedial. Mm -hmm. You know, it was more the picture than the actual words. So to have a story without a picture this time around and listen to the words and actually come up with the pictures in my own head, I guess is kind of where I was at through the whole thing. It was more of a in my head visual versus a character cartoon and just how, I don't know, it was more beautiful than a children's book in, to, in some mm -hmm. sense, you know what I mean? just the grandiose of it all beautiful i love it because you created your own you know that the magic of reading and having For sure. your own theater of the mind right mm -hmm. book is always better than the picture right <laughs> that's right alchemy wrote about stone soup in the chat mimi are you able to see the chat let me let me open that chat back up Oh, a thrift store called Stone Soup. Oh, there was a man. Now I heard it that it was about um, soldiers. Mm -hmm. You know, it comes in and uh, uh, the the story. Thank you, Alchemy, for including that. Uh, and there is a thrift store in Minneapolis called Th Stone Soup, isn't there? I don't know. Well, hmm. where was that store? Um <laughs> We, uh, when I, uh, encountered that, that was also through elementary school mm -hmm. and I just never forgot about it. I just thought the idea of stone soup and people, do you all know the story? Mm -hmm. My mm -hmm. mom was a grocery school teacher and she used to use that story all the time about how everybody contributes, right? Yeah. We would we would have a whole uh, two week section on um, different fairy tales and, you know, from gingerbread to whatever. And one of them was stone soup. Everybody brings something from home and and together. Then we cooked and made uh, all the stone soup together. Maybe the original potluck. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> all the pot in the, in the stone soup. Well, um. What I want us to take away from this, what I want us to think about in this story is that um, I'm glad you're participating with us, Alchemy. You know, thank you. We're catching you through the chat. Um, is this idea, there are two books that have been, you know, I just turned 64. And in the last couple of years, you know, this book has been around since the early 90s. And this book... Uh, has not been around so long, as long. I had a terrible car accident and I asked people to send me acts of beauty. And one friend sent me this book, which is 2017. And sometimes you'll see this name, Tokopa Turner. That's her. She's a Jungian. And this book is called Belonging, Remembering Ourselves Home. And from this, this mm -hmm. book is incredible, especially because it's Jungian and Jungian is so much more capable of coming to us through our feminine ethereal side. You know, there's a chapter on, on uh, the divine marriage that is broken between Eros and Logos. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Logos is that... Uh, Logos discovers what he calls irrefutable truth. So logic and science and replicative, you know, but Eros is not, not just erotic. Eros is chaos and pure feeling and real connection. And that chapter is followed about exile and the importance of exile. So I encourage you to- uh, author again? I'm sorry. Tokopa Turner. Is this backwards for you all, by the way? Oh, no. no. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, Women Who Run With the Wolves, early 90s, and yep. Tokopa Turner's Belonging, yeah, Remembering Ourselves Home. Because she's bringing us in this book to our home, this home, you know, the home where we can be with ourselves. And the line in uh, Estesis, um, Clarissa's, uh, 
retelling of the story of the ugly duckling comes from the chapter finding one's pace plate finding one's pack belonging as blessing there's a moment remember when he, he the the woman had found that the old woman had a cat you know that was uh. uncombed it didn't take care of itself but it caught mice and she also had a cross-eyed hen but at least she laid eggs and and <laughs> you know that hen says well, what good are you if you can't lay and you cannot catch and this ugly duckling has an awareness enough of an awareness about itself that says what i love best side the duckling is to be under whether it's under the wide blue sky or under the cool blue water this is a really amazing statement i think because somehow this being this swan this unidentified swan no has some sense of self-awareness and knows what it likes and knows something about itself it doesn't lay eggs and it doesn't catch mice but it does love to be under water or sky so of course he got he got a, he left there and he went down the road to another pond and he was swimming around and it gets colder and colder a flock of creatures flew overhead the most beautiful he had ever seen they cried down to him and hearing their sounds made his heart leap and break at the same time. That line couldn't just make me cry. Mm -hmm. He cried back in a sound he had never before made. He had never seen creatures more beautiful, and he had never felt more bereft. So right in the, in the telling of the story, it's when the duckling swan has some self-awareness and says, I love to be under. This is not the place for me. I'll just find another pond. And then in the pond, here's the foreshadowing, you know, of something so beautiful. And they cry to him and he can make the same sound. But he doesn't know what it means. He doesn't know what they are. He doesn't know where they're going, but he's had some taste of something that can't even be identified they cried down to him and hearing their sounds made his heart leap and break at the same time so for the next 15 minutes here's what we'll do now we're going to do another free write oh sorry Mimi did I did I not say we cut it down to an hour instead of two hours <laughs> oops um no that's okay so if people what? stay for a little bit um oh i'm sorry <laughs> oh shit we didn't get to do the generative writing i thought it was two hours i uh, looked back at my notes sorry well we can keep going for um maybe another 20 minutes if people are able to stay or we'll see how it goes is that okay, okay. If I can stay for a little bit All right, let's do it let's do a five minute write on this prompt okay. and i'm so sorry that everybody no, i'm sorry somehow we got that mixed up <laughs> we're going to do a five minute write okay. and what we're going to do is uh, we're going to write to this prompt and then we're going to have the option to share please stay as long as you can and if you can't <laughs> i understand because i i just got new information <laughs> sorry think about that awareness that the the duckling has the swan has in front of the cross-eyed hen <laughs> and uncombed cat that likes to be under. And when it leaves and goes to a pond, it gets a signal. And the sound of those swans calling to him, he's able to make that sound and never heard it before. It still doesn't know who he is. I want you to write to what that sound embodies. When you're in your when you're in exile, what is calling out to you? I'm going to put that in the chat. When you're in your exile, write a poem to what's calling out to you.
making your heart leap and break at the same time. Okay, I'm setting it for five.
Okay. All right. That timer has gone off. And I'm going to say, do you need another minute? It's only four of us left to share. No? <laughs> no. I'm good. Well, if this is optional sharing, um, would you like to? Who would like to share? You don't have to, but you're encouraged. And you're surrounded by uh, people who respect each other. And this is a safe space to express yourself. And please know that whatever you say stays here. And we can take lessons, but not other people's stories. So let's just respect each other and applaud. Who would like to go first? Well, I can. I'm just wondering, um, are we just sharing what we just wrote, right? Not what we wrote earlier? You share whatever you want. What do, What would you like to share? Well, that, I would like to share, well, I can share what I just wrote, but I'd like to also um, talk about when you, going back to what you first said about the channels being opened and the artist is not pleased, um, you touched on something about, um, that made me think of this line from the movie, Where Have You Gone Bernadette, with Kate Blanchett, and Kate Blanchett's like an architect, which is also an artist, right, and so she goes kind of wacky. And because she hasn't been creating for a long time. And this guy says, if an artist isn't allowed to create, they become a menace to society. <laughs> and I was just like, that is so true. It is so true. And that's what you're basically saying with that quote. Like, we ha you have to create. If you don't create, you're depressed. And if you're depressed, you <laughs> have to do something, right? Otherwise, you be definitely become a menace to society. So um, I was just thinking a lot about that. Um, but I can read what I just wrote. Um, but kind of like the one I wrote before about shut in, shut out and exile. So I think okay. that if I kind of combine those, you'll get more of the sense of what I'm really trying to say. Um, so I said, shut in, shut up, curled up, shut out, out loud, shout outside, exile a mile. What's here? What's there? What's near? What's anywhere? That thing? No, the thing next to it. Is it closer than we think? Death, this fear of death. We can't exile death. It's always here. Um, so then this last part I wrote, voices, they don't stop. Can't be in the present because the voices are in the past or the future and they jump back and forth. Age, death, death, age, present, moment, meditate, questions, more questions, no answer. One answer, who cares? That's kind of a question too, son of a bitch. Don't give up. Of course yeah. not. I never do. Wow. That is wonderful. The questions don't, don't question, just answer. Who cares? Another question. It's great. <laughs> and you also uh, almost, you posited this idea that made me write it down as a potential idea or a prompt with death as exile, you know, can we exile death? But what if, what if we, I'm going to go the other way and think of death as an exile. That was really Really something, Kelly. Great. Thank you for sharing that. You And you read it like a poet. It came out like poetry. <laughs> yeah, I did study poetry for a while. <laughs> yeah, I give, I give snaps. I give applause and snaps. I love snaps. Thank you. And I just found out that when you were, um, when people aren't invited to something, they feel left out. And it's a physical pain now, they're saying. Because mm. back in the day, when you were exiled and left out of something, you died because you couldn't survive on your own. I thought that was so interesting. So they said, if, if you feel ex exiled or left out, take ibuprofen because it's a physical pain and it'll work. Wow. Wow. Beautiful. Thank you, Kelly. And free medical advice. Yeah. <laughs> Would Mel or Deb like to go? Oh, I think she, Deb, you're, you're muted, talking, hon. You're muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. What? Huh? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, what calls to me in Excel? Singing. When I hear a song and feel all alone, somehow that forms a slight connection. I rec I recognize the song and I can sing along because I know the words and the melody. 
Like if you hear silence and it's empty and all of a sudden you hear something in the silence, for example, the humming of an appliance, is it makes it makes me crave more sound. Or when there's too much sound, I crave silence, but I can still hear the song. <clears throat> when I feel shut out, I feel sad. If I feel sad, I know I don't have to feel like it's the only option. I think I learned this early on, that there's always another chance or an option if I can be free enough to take it. Yay. Yay. <laughs> what a high note, beautiful to end on. That's wonderful. And I, I love that idea. You crave silence. You crave. Can you read that part again? You yeah. Crave, oh, you, um, <clears throat> Okay, the humming. Okay, it makes me crave more sound. Or when there's too much sound, then I crave silence. Yeah, beautiful. Really wanting both and then not wanting either. Wonderful. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that naming too. Yeah, that's wonderful. And then usually when there's silence, there's still a song in your head, right? So it's never really. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's like an earworm, you yeah. know. Like, yep. You can't get it out of your head. Yeah. Or tinnitus, which really stinks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Deb. Thank you for choosing to share. I love this. We're not going to do feedback from everybody. We're just going to, this is sharing. And oh, I just want to share. I mean, we're already almost a half an hour. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah. I'm thinking I'm ending a half an hour early. No. Half an right? Hour. It's all perspective. Yes. Okay, Mel. Okay, I've never shared ever. So let's go. Oh for my it. God! Did I just expect that you were going to sh share? Did I? No, just... I'll sh I. Wonderful. I put shit out there all the time. I just never okay. write and I've never shared. So this okay, is all great. all a first. Excellent. So there we go. Yes. Um. So you said, "What's calling out to you while in exile?" Um. Said, "What is it that is in my heart? What is it that my heart hears? What is it that I have that I need? Do I live between two worlds? Where do I belong? Where do I fit in?" What does it feel like to be at peace and not wonder where is it that I should be? Walking between two places with a foot in each world, one accepting because of physical appearance and one another due to my mental cognizance. Where is it? Where is my comfort? Where is my joy? Will this unbelonging, not fitting in always be? When can my soul rest? Wondering, waiting, longing, wishing, unsettled, hoping for love, acceptance, and support. Oh. Wondering. I love that you named two worlds. It's wonderful. First, you name the, you know, you drop the seed of what it's going to be, and then you give us both worlds. And it does feel like they might both be going that way, the way a riptide does, you know, separating away from each other. But you're the one riding in the middle of it and naming it. You know, we do have two brain halves, you know, or six, depending on. Oh, you again. Yes, <laughs> and it's really I, I also really acknowledge and uh and um appreciate your uh, your calling in not calling out the idea of um that you occupy a world because you're able also and you're cognizant because you have mental capacity and that really by acknowledging that you also acknowledge the people who are, you know, not able to get along in the world like that. Uh, and it's really conscientious and I really appreciate that. I, I love writing that's, you know, contemporary and aware. Uh, that's, that was wonderful. Yay, I'm glad you shared, Mel. <laughs> yeah, Mel, thank you. I want to say one, one quick thing. I liked how when you started out with the the um judgments about writing and how it has to be you have to make money and it yeah. seemed like it related to the ugly duckling and that they were making judgments from their point of view right off the bat they were just saying that right off the bat and that, mm -hmm. that it took you the whole story to get to what really the value was and he didn't have to like with the cat and the hen he didn't have to do these useful things you just felt, you know, and that 
that to me is what writing is about is just you writing and you feeling and you feeling how you really feel instead of basing it on you know limiting yourself to judgments from the outside yeah mm-hmm. and there that reminds me of this quote i just um came across this year and i can't remember all of it now but it was basically like if you want to change the world with your art it it's okay if you just change one person and that person is yourself mm-hmm. yay that's it many are called but few are chosen the <laughs> calling is in you choose yourself that's the choice that's the chooser <laughs> Beautiful. Wow. And how does one get there? Is that not a whole nother episode? Because, <laughs> yeah. Uh, or a series. Yes, or a whole series, a whole workshop series. I will say these two books really are uh, just, they're gifts. You know, these books will really <laughs> add, add to your whole life. You'll be very Fact, happy. I got, I got a copy of that book. It's a gift. And now I have to find it among all my other books. Now you got to find it. Oh, you, you got a book. It. You got bookshelf in there. It's there. Yep. <laughs> thank you so well, thank much. You so much. Is there any other thing that you'd like to say for conclusion? Um, you know, your, your, your purpose is something that, you know, and the first it's what you just said is, you know, that the artist has to serve themselves. And if you don't make yourself happy and if your art is not making you satisfied, then there's no point to it. It's not about making other people satisfied. And it's not about, you know, this recognition or the National Book Critics Circle Award or a, a nomination for this prize or that one. It's really about saving your own life. You know? I mean, I Kelly... If you send me that quote and you say Martha Graham, I will find the Martha Graham quote, you know, even if I have to type it myself. Okay. Or you can send me the picture of that and I'll type it for you. (laughs) Okay, great. (laughs) I need to, I need to put it into better line breaks because every time I read it, it it doesn't break the right way. (laughs) Wow. Well, this was really lovely. I thank you all so much. Thank you for the invitation, Kelly. Yeah, I'm gonna guess that you know if there's a competition on who gets to have uh, who wins because of their attendance, I bet you Karen Williams writing workshop had a lot of people. Ah, well, I don't know. We were just kind of launching the program, so I I can tell you right now how many. (laughs) No, that's all right. That's all. Yeah, we had (laughs) thirteen. Yes, but we, we've, had up, we've had up to 26 so we're doing pretty good for our first time around with this cabin fever reliever oh that is wonderful well 